afternoon. Uh, if you already do not know, I am Chetan Singh Solanki, I am faculty from uh, Department of Energy Science and Engineering uh, at IIT Bombay. Uh, this is only IIT to have such department and we are focusing a uh, lot on energy both uh, conventional as well as non-conventional energy. Uh, I have done my uh, masters in microelectronics from IIT Bombay itself 97 and then I did uh, PhD from uh, IMEC that is inter university microelectronics center in Belgium uh, that I graduated in 2004 and since 2004 uh, I am with IIT Bombay. So, I, so as such I have been uh, researching on solar photovoltaic technology for about 11 years now and uh, I have seen uh, the development of PV research particularly in the country from the very beginning and lot of things now happening but uh, early 1999 when I decided to work on PV people thought you know it was really stupid decision to work on it because being in microelectronics you, you have all kind of uh, access to the companies like Texas Instruments and all where I actually worked for some time before going for PhD. So now it is a very good time to be in photovoltaics and there is a lot of activities happening uh, in the country and in the world uh, and uh, I am sure in the future as well uh, there will be more and more uh, requirement of the manpower and researchers. And therefore, I think this is the perfect time to start uh, such activity on photovoltaics. Uh, so, one thing I would like to request is uh, that uh, please ask question when and uh, whenever you ask, uh, whenever you feel uh, that there is a need for question, mic will be available. Uh, please ask them without any hesitation uh, and let us make it very interactive and uh, so that uh, you learn out of it uh, uh, and you utilize your time better and I utilize my time better. Uh, the whole idea of this uh, five days is that uh, we will not have uh, enough time to cover the entire syllabus that uh, is planned for December workshop. The idea of this workshop is to get a glimpse of, of, of it, how we are going to conduct the, the courses so that back at home you can actually do the better coordination. So together with the, the way we have planned, you must have the, the timetable now with you right now. Uh, what we have planned is uh, together with the several theory. Uh, lectures, there are laboratories and, and tutorials and we will take uh, help of our other students uh, the, <coughs> for conducting tutorials. Uh, what also, uh, I have written a book on uh, uh, solar photovoltaics, it is called Solar Photovoltaics Fundamentals, Technologies and Applications. Uh, right now this book is not available in the market, otherwise the plan was to give one book to uh, each of you right now, but uh, I am sure this book is going uh, under. Uh, uh, review and going for the second edition which will be out in about a month's time. Uh, so when uh, during the December workshop this book will be given to all 1000 participants. So we will ask who are the, uh, how many people have registered in your center and then this book will be sent to all of you. We will try to send one book to you in advance so that uh, you know. So uh, quite a significant part of the, the course is actually being taught from this particular book. So let me uh, let me begin. Uh, again, another thing is that uh, while uh, going through this, I'm sure uh, many of you are already aware of uh, some of the issues or the, the things that we are going to talk about uh, here. But the whole idea is to conduct this workshop in a manner uh, as we are going to conduct in December uh, for the other teachers. Uh, also, I have seen from the morning session is that not all of you are having full-fledged course on solar photovoltaics. Uh, but it may happen as there is a lot of demand on photovoltaic, it may happen that in future you actually conduct this kind of course. So this whole uh, course is planned as if it is a one full course which not only takes care of the fundamentals but also talks a little bit about the technologies and, and the power electronic side as well as the application. Uh, so as a result what we have tried is actually to put together a, a good overview about uh, uh, the PV technologies and the application so that a student going through such program or such course would have enough knowledge about the photovoltaic technology and uh, depending on the, the need or requirement, he may pursue MTech and PhD programs or he may go to the industry directly. So, so this kind of knowledge will be sufficient for having that kind of background. Any questions so far? So, so let me start. Okay, so uh, uh, electric uh, city scenario of India generation, uh, what you can see here in uh, you might be knowing already that uh, total we have about 170,000 megawatts 
of which uh, coal is significant, hydro is about 25, 26 percent, nuclear very small percentage, gas is not that big. Renewable is now getting bigger and bigger uh, share of our installed electricity. Uh, so, this comes, uh, so this comes uh, to about uh, 13,000 megawatt and out of which majority of his is, uh, is a wind, uh, wind turbines. The contribution of solar, photovoltaic and thermal is very small right now. But because of the Jawaharlal Nehru National Solar Mission, we expect that this number, this share uh, of the pie is to go big, bigger and bigger. Uh, one other important thing we must uh, take always a notice that there is a difference in the installed capacity of a conventional grid connected power plant and the capacity of the renewable uh, energy system. So, for example, even if you have let us say 10,000 megawatts of solar photovoltaic module, but 10,000 megawatt does not operate for 24 hours. So, there is a capacity factor which is much smaller than the coal based power plant. So, coal based power plant of let us say 10 megawatt will operate for 80 to 90 percent of the time, while same 10 megawatt power plant of photovoltaic will not operate for 80 to 90 percent of time. So, therefore, the amount of energy generated from renewable energy system for the same install capacity is normally much lower than the amount of energy generated from the conventional for uh, conventional technology. So, that we should keep in mind. So, in a way this share actually is little bit misleading. Okay. So, if you look at the share of energy provided by the renewable energy, it is much lower. It is not uh, what you can see here is, uh, is about uh, 10 percent, it will be like 2.5 percent. Okay, so, finally, the goal is not to put, uh, not to only increase the share in terms of the megawatt capacity, but to increase the share in terms of total electricity generated, that is more important. Uh, as I told in the morning that uh, right now our per capita per year energy consumption is only 650, while world average is 2000, while the many developed countries have more than 10,000 and about 400 million people do not have access to electricity and uh, as per the ministry of power 80,000 villages are not connected uh, with the grid right now. Okay, so, there is a huge demand for energy and uh, solar energy solution can be one appropriate solution uh, to supply that energy requirement. Jawaharlal Nehru National Solar Mission is, is giving lot of push to the solar photovoltaic technology and uh, as you can see here, it actually plans to go up to the 20,000 megawatts of solar power. So, uh, what I was talking is that uh, there is a huge uh, push provided by the National Nehru Solar Mission and uh, you can see the phase wise minute is going from the 1000 megawatt, 4000 and 20,000 uh, by year 2022. And lot of this power is actually will be in the form of the off grid system, uh, which is about uh, 2000 megawatt. Uh, uh, which is perfectly the case that you people are talking that the uh, street lighting, uh, small uh, home lighting system, solar lantern, everything comes in this. And my personal guess is this number will be actually bigger than uh, the grid connected power because there is a lot of areas where uh, there is no power and the solar energy can immediately supply the power. Uh, not only the national, uh, not only the government of India, but there are many state government that is uh, now taking active part in the, uh, not mission, but they have created their own policy. Uh, for example, Gujarat is one of them. Gujarat has policy of about something like uh, uh, about 500 megawatts of solar power uh, and it is actually uh, moving very fast. So, these are the other states where solar power is being uh, kind of planned and, and going. Uh, so, this is the what uh, is being applied so far. So, this is the not capacity installed, but under the Jawaharlal Nehru National Solar Mission, this much is the planned capacity. And as you can see from the slide that this is the phase one, where in which is ending in 2013, uh, where by which, by which time we should have about 1000 meg megawatt of installed capacity. And I see that is happening very much, there is lot of people uh, which are, who are interested in it. And there are many state governments that are actually doing it, as you can see. Uh, Rajasthan is a lot of inst installed capacity, but you, you find other parts of also uh, like uh, Maharashtra, uh, the Mahajenko, Maharashtra state government uh, is actually planning for 120 megawatt of uh, the photovoltaic power plant. Uh, if it is installed before then other power plant, this will be the world's biggest solar PV plant in, it is being planned in Dhule, uh, a place called Sakri. Some of you are aware of Sakri in Dhule. 
But as you can see, there are the other states, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Punjab, who are actually taking initiative to install solar PV plants. And under the National uh, Nehru Solar Mission, there are a lot of initiatives that are being taken uh, actually to promote the PV technology and installation of the PV technology. Uh, and the initiatives are taken at the all fronts. So, for example, in terms of the technology, uh, 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 there is a push for all the technology, not only crystalline silicon. We will see what are the various technology. The feed in tariff is being provided. Uh, the feed in tariff is uh, 17.91 rupees per unit of electricity. So, that is the government promises to buy that electricity at that cost, which is very attractive business proposition. And that is why there is a lot of interest in the country about the feed in tariff. This policy is new to India, but it has been uh, under operation for uh, for years for many countries and Germany is one of the leading example. Germany, Japan, Spain, uh, these are the leading countries and now some of the states of US also. For example, California is the first st state where such uh, policies are being uh, executed. There is also what is called a renewable er energy purchase uh, obligation for the state uh, electricity generation boards. Okay, so the I think right now the plan is that state electricity board should uh, install 0.25 percent of their capacity uh, with solar energy. And the 0.25 percent by the way by all means is very large number, okay, though it is in terms of percent very small. But installing that much amount of renewable energy technology or the photovoltaic or solar thermal is, is a big number. A main power generation as I said many of the programs are, are happening around the country. Uh, there is a promotion for the domestic production. So, the people are encouraged to, uh, to install the manufacturing in the country and various soft loans are available. Uh, scalability because there are several way, there are several phases in which this national mission is planned going from the phase 1 to phase 3 and the application is focused on both grid and off grid uh, systems. So, there is a huge all kind of uh, things are being taken care in this national mission. This is uh, the current installation in terms of the production of the cells and modules. As you can see now, there are many, many companies which are doing the production of the cells and modules. So, there are about 15 com com companies who are doing uh, solar cell production and our total capacity is now 675 megawatt. Uh, number which is small, but still growing very fast. In terms of the photovoltaic module, our capacity is about 1.1 gigawatt, which is again a significant number. Uh, so, one thing to be noticed that uh, however, the large capacities both in terms of megawatt 675 megawatt right and how much I said uh, our installed capacity right now for the PV. The installed capacity the, the power plants are only 10, 10 to 15 megawatts okay? while our production capacity is 675 for solar cell and 1000 megawatt for solar field module. So, what happens to those module? they are all exported. So, what does it mean? There is a very good uh, very good manufacturing capacity uh, exists in the country, but there is not enough market and that is why traditionally all these cells and modules have been actually uh, been sub actually exported to the other countries like Germany uh, uh, and Spain uh, being one of them. But now we see that uh, because of the national mission there is a more and more deployment coming. So, now significant number not significant means still we are only about using 20, 25 percent of our gen, um, total production capacity, but in future it is likely to improve. So, th there is a significant growth in industry going from uh, 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 0.06 megawatt in 2005 to 1.1 gigawatt, uh, I am sorry 60 megawatt to 1.1 gigawatt in 2010. So, huge uh, growth and this growth is about uh, uh, compound annual growth rate CAGR is about 75 percent very, very high growth rate. I do not think there is any other industry in the country which is growing with such a with such a high rate. So, which is good sign and we see that uh, more and more uh, of the deployment will occur. And the, the important thing for, uh, for all of us as a teacher is that uh, there is going to be more demand for the students both for the researchers, technical level, deployment level and all kind of thing. And that is where our role is actually to create that kind of manpower. Uh, which will very much uh, be required to uh, for for the nation to be succeed. Just to give an example, the, uh, for example, in 2004-5, China was nowhere in the scene uh, when we're looking at the the worldwide production of the solar cells and modules, 
China was nowhere when you look at the data from 2004 and 5. You know what is the current status? China has surpassed every other country in the world. They are the number one producer of the solar photovoltaic modules and cells and the raw material itself. Okay. So, such a huge difference in just five years time and uh, of course, we are nowhere close to it, but uh, we cannot ignore the solar energy. There has to be uh, enough uh, uh, deployment of solar energy and therefore, um, both uh, research as well as uh, as the deployment level, we need a uh, large amount of manpower and also money. Okay, so, uh, I think there is no doubt about this slide that solar PV uh, voltage technology uh, can use uh, solar radiation as a resource and produce a lot of energy. And uh, uh, the resource is, is uh, tremendous. So, only a small percentage of the, the solar radiation if you convert into the electricity, uh, you will have enough electricity for the whole country. Uh, I think when we do the solar radiation, we will discuss this point that only about 60 kilometer by 40 kilometer area, if you put the solar PV module, it will be good enough to generate electricity for the whole country, all our electricity requirement. And I think our country is very big, 3000 kilometer by some 2500 kilometers. So, our area is huge. So, very small percentage of area will be good enough. We will do the calculation on that. Okay, so, however, there are challenges to be overcome if you really want to deploy it at the, the large uh, area, high cost per unit watt uh, and uh, and that is basically the cost of the material is very high right now. Uh, but I have seen tremendous changes from uh, uh, from even my research times. So uh, but over the period, it has really changed significantly. So solar photovoltaic module, the cost was something like uh, uh, one thousand dollar per watt. That was the cost in seventy three seventy five when the solar photovoltaic technology came into the picture first time. And it has really come down significantly, particularly over the last two years. You know what is the cost of module current, current cost of PV module? 3 to? 6 to 70 rupees per watt. Any other guess? 120 rupees per watt. 120, 85. Okay. So, these are kind of number you will, you will see. Okay. So, uh, in terms of the price, what you see in the market today, particularly the crystalline silicon solar cell technology, you will get it at about, uh, when you are going for the large scale, hundreds of kilowatts, you will get it at the rate about 95 to 100 rupees per watt. Uh, some of the thin film technology, you may get lower than that, so you may get it at 80, 85 rupees. Or if you buy in a, in a more retail uh, manner, 1 kilowatt, 500 watt, then you will get it maybe 100 and 110 rupees per watt. Okay. This number just two years before was 220, 250 rupees, 280 rupees per watt. Okay. So, within within last two years, uh, the drop in the, the PV module price is significant and it has it has come down to below 100 rupees about 2, uh, 2 to 2.2 dollars per watt, which is very fascinating. Uh, I do not know if you are following the research. For me, it is really fascinating that now for many applications, the solar photovoltaic has already become the cost effective. Uh, as compared to the grid and connected system. But still that is a challenge. Okay. Even the 2.2 uh, $2 dollar or about 100 rupees per watt is still a large number and we would like to see this cost as low as 40 rupees, 50 rupees per watt. Okay. So, there is still a challenge in terms of the material. The efficiencies are moderate, but not too bad. Uh, the efficiencies that we get uh, uh, the module today is at the rate of 14 percent, 15 percent. Uh, there are people who are also producing modules at 19, 20 percent, 21 percent. And the solar cell has efficiency for crystalline silicon cell has been demonstrated over 20, uh, 24, 25 percent. And for the multi junction over 42 percent or so. So, there has been large uh, kind of uh, improvement in the efficiency and uh, uh, further improvement is required. And if there is a time, I will tell you that efficiency is not the only number to look for. It is the cost per unit watt is that is more important. So, there are technology which can make the solar cell at 25 percent efficient uh, uh, efficiency, but not everybody makes the solar cell at 25 percent efficiency, because the cost of doing that is too high uh, and therefore, efficiency is not the only number to look for. It is the cost of production for a given efficiency eventually converted into the, the cost in terms of rupees per watt of PV module, that is the more important number. What we What is also a challenge is the availability of material. So, uh, should not actually develop a technology which is uh, which is using a material which is not available abundantly. 
okay right now the worldwide in worldwide production of solar pv modules is about uh, uh, any idea any guess worldwide production of solar pv modules no guess just guess any number yeah 9 gigawatt so it has already crossed almost about 12 gigawatt okay uh, which is a big number right 10 12000 megawatts of solar pv modules and putting this together this is still a very small percentage of worldwide installed uh, grid electricity okay installed capacity is in terawatts so the the 10 gigawatt or 12 gigawatt is still a very nice small number what does it mean that if you really want if you really see that photovoltaic modules are going to be a solution for the future electricity generation we are going to we are talking about the module manufacturing in terawatt level and when you go into terawatt level your material requirements are huge and if you are using any material which is not abundantly available you are in trouble for example the cadmium telluride or cigs for example copper indium gallium selenide the indium is a rare earth okay the indium uh, is being used for all uh, lcd displays indium is being used as a tco uh, and many other application so the indium cost used to be pre this era used to be something like 40 to 50 dollar per kilogram you know what is the any guess for the indium cost right now 1500 to 2000 dollars per kilogram now just because it's so rare that if you try to use more and more of it uh, the cost is going to escalate and therefore uh, when you talk about solar pv technology we should really look for the materials which are abundantly available so that we don't you know get into the limitation silicon which is commonly used material is not of that category so it is really abundantly available and therefore not a problem you can produce as much as uh, cells and modules as you want long term stability is another challenge for the pv technology uh, right now the life of the pv module is supposed to be 25 years okay uh, 25 year means even after 25 years the module is supposed to give you 80% of its performance that is how we define the life 80% of its initial performance should still be giving at the end of 25 years so therefore it is important to choose the material we can where you can get a stable performance for the long long period of time long energy payback period is another issue so you should not use a material where a lot of energy goes in making a solar cell right if you put lot of energy in making a solar cell how you can recover that energy from the solar cell if that will not happen then uh, there is no point in making a solar cell itself okay right now the payback energy for crystalline silicon solar cell is about 2 to 3 years which is still very high a lot of energy goes in making a solar cell okay so what does it mean the solar cell the crystalline silicon solar cell itself takes 2 to 3 years to generate energy which has gone into making silicon solar cell so out of 25 years lifetime 3 years or 2 to 3 years is of no use so therefore we should try to minimize the the energy that goes in making a solar cell and some of the thin film technology are good at it and their energy peak by period is uh, is less than a year and the most important thing the money payback period okay it should give us money back right whatever we are putting it if that is not the case no industry would come forward and and actually invest money into it but uh, so as the cost goes down money payback period is also goes down and and again it is a challenge so these are all uh, all of these are the challenge for any solar pv technology this is common to all of them you take it crystalline silicon amorphous silicon cigs organic solar any technology you call it the ma the main challenge are this if you can fulfill all this wonderful I, I tell my student that if you can fulfill all this this is the route to become billionaire you solve this problem and I'm, i guarantee that you will become billionaire very next day because there is a huge demand right a lot of lot of people are actually i'm coming from uh, as i said us and santa clara california california the bay area i don't know if you heard of it it's a, it's a silicon valley it is also called silicon valley and silicon valley is the place where all the new technology comes in so if you have a very good idea go to silicon valley people will give millions of dollars immediately and uh, you can make the difference okay but what is required is solution to this problems or at least one of this problem if not all of this problem even at one of this is also okay okay fine so here is the my lecture starts now so this was the introduction any questions so far i know all of you are many of you are feeling sleepy and it's really difficult task to keep people awake just after the lunch so if anybody yeah
China modules are they imported in India? And if yes, then uh, would what guarant warranty it comes? Well, uh, China modules are being imported in India. Yes, uh, but th many of them don't believe them. Uh, the thing is that as long as uh, there is a certification called IEC 61215, okay, uh, uh, International Electro Technical Commission certifies the module. I mean, they have actually come up with this code, and any manufacturer before selling it to the Indian market, at least uh, or outside also, should actually pass this module, this test, IEC 61215. And once they are passed, then it is kind of guaranteed that they will actually perform under condition for that long time. Uh, yeah, so I would not like to comment more than that. Okay, so, which material to be used for solar cell application and if you understand this, you understand half of the solar photovoltaic. Okay, any idea? So, which material we can use for solar photovoltaics? Semiconductor, very good and why semiconductor? Why not aluminum? Should it be PN junction? Why not silicon oxide? Why not silicon nitride? And one. Okay, so we, we should actually let us start looking at the uh, the electron flow in a coal-based power plant. Okay, can you draw the electron? Uh, how how what happens to the electron when it goes through cycle? Right, electron must be going through a cycle. Right, it, at at power plant something happens to it, then it is transmitted into the transmission line. Something happens to it, then it goes through the load like. Know, tube light and all it something happens to it and then it goes back to the power line and that is how its cycle is completed right and we want our solar cell to do the same job right it should also be doing same thing as the electricity from the coal is doing so so what happens to the electron is uh, if i if i draw the uh, if i draw the let's say potential uh, of the electron and uh, uh, so at the power plant what we are doing is we are raising its potential Okay, so this is what happens is the power plant, right? I'm drawing very simple. So, uh, some arbitrary reference number it, it is it is raised its potential is raised to some level. How much level? What is the output voltage at the power plant level? Some thousands of kV. <laughs> Third, 11 kV, 33 kV or even higher also depending. Okay, So, it is a thousands of kV. So, we, we actually uh, increase its potential uh, potential to a some certain number and then it goes to the substations and a substation the voltage is dropped and dropped right and eventually when it is delivered to the home, it is at certain voltage 230 volt right. So, it comes to 230 volt and then finally, we, we actually use it in the load it comes down to the same potential where of course, there is a drop in the lines and all we are not considering. It comes down to the same level and then it goes to the cycle, right. This is what happens in terms of potential. It increases its potential at the power plant and then it goes to the various step down voltages eventually the load and it comes back. And I want same thing to happen to electron in a solar cell or I want same thing to happen to a material which is used for solar cell application, right. So, what does it mean? Somewhere in a material, its potential should increase. Okay, and uh, and knowing the material properties, uh, uh, it is not possible to use any metals for this kind of application. You cannot use any metals for this kind of application because why not? Metals are the continuous band gap material. The band gap is continuous. So, there is no no way we can create a potential difference. Even if electron gets energy in the in the in the metal, it will lose its energy. Uh, in the in terms of the heat, so you will not get this kind of the enhancement in the potential. Okay, fine. So why not to use insulators? Insulators have also a certain kind of band gap, right? You can use insulator. It's also a certain kind of band gap. Why don't we use insulator then? It's a large compared to what? The so insulators have large band gap. Agreed. Compared to what? Right, good point. So, compared to energy available to the photon, it is very large, right. You know, we, we need to have, we need to conduct this operation in solar cell. This operation is done by, <coughs> so I am now coming to the solar cell. This operation is done by putting a photon on it. 
So, the photon should actually do this job of increasing the potential energy. Okay? But if this level is very high as compared to the energy of the photon in the spectrum, then this will never happen and the insulator band gap is very high. How much high? Silicon oxide has a band gap of about 5 electron volt. Some insulator has a band gap of 8 electron volt. What is the highest energy of the photon in the solar spectrum? <coughs> we can do the calculation later, but uh, let me tell you right now the highest energy is about 3.5 electron volt. Okay? So, what does it mean? Immediately it now makes me clear that I cannot use any material first of all which is more than 3.5 electron volt. right? I cannot use any material where the band gap is overlapping or 0 like in metals. So, what are the materials I can use? All those materials which is having band gap energy between 0 to 3.5 electron volt I can use them. Okay? And these materials in our definition are called semiconductors. Okay? So, remember that in solar cell I need to do this operation okay? and we will get back. So, in solar cell I need to do this operation so that we can uh, we can electron to go through the same cycle again. Okay, so, uh, so that is what we uh, in, in metals we have this kind of arrangement the bands are overlapping and therefore, you cannot create that kind of potential difference which you want to create and you cannot create therefore, the potential voltage or, or therefore, you cannot use it for electricity generation, but you can use this kind of material for for heat generation. So, this is this kind of material are the perfect materials for solar thermal technology. right? You want to actually generate in heat in solar thermal and you want to generate voltage in solar photovoltaic that is the fundamental difference. right? So, when you want to generate heat it is this kind of material and when you want to generate the voltage it is this kind of material. What is this kind of material? There is a one band, there is another band, there is a band gap and this is where we would do the operation which is done in the power plant. This is where the electron is actually given the extra energy to get in to increase its potential energy and that is what we want. So, we need a material with some kind of band gap and therefore, semiconductors are the material which can use for solar cell and metals are the material which can be used for solar thermal technology. What are the materials that we can use? Many for example, silicon is the most commonly used material almost 80 percent of the modules being produced worldwide today are from silicon, but then you have many other semiconductors gallium arsenide. Uh, cadmium telluride, cadmium and telluride, you have combination of the indium, gallium, zinc is being used, boron, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, sulfur, everything, everything is used. Okay? And not only this, we also use in combination of the two. So, not only the elemental semiconductor, we also use combination of the two. For example, compound semiconductor like gallium arsenide, the world's highest solar solar cells are actually highest efficiency solar cells are made in gallium arsenide and its compound. Ternary compounds algas, allium gallium and arsenide and quaternary compound allium gallium arsenic, arsenic phosphide. Okay? So, people try to mix various kinds of material uh, to actually make the solar cell and we actually have the various compounds that, uh, that are being used for solar cell applications. Why do people mix and match? Why do people make the compound semiconductor and uh, actually many kind of uh, material? Try to get the best properties of the material to the fine tuning and what is the best property we are looking for? We are looking for the, the best band gap and there are two important properties that we are looking for. One is the best optical property which is the, the appropriate band gap and for solar cell application the best or the highest efficiency is possible when your band gap is 1.45 electron volt. Okay? So, that is the material we look for, but that is not all. We are also looking for the material which is having band gap of 1.45 electron volt, but also having good electrical properties means high conductivity, high lifetime, <coughs> high diffusion length, uh, uh, higher minority carrier lifetime and so on. So, there are two electrical properties uh, and, and to combine it put together we are looking to have the best optical and best electrical property at the at the lowest possible cost. So, that is a major constraint. So, you want to, so that is why people are trying to actually use many, many materials. <coughs> so, the next question is fine we need to use semiconductor of the suitable band gap and electrical properties. So, the next question is can semiconductor alone work as a solar cell? Can we use just a p type solar, solar uh, semiconductor and say okay, give me electricity out of it? Can we do that? 
as you know we cannot do that right what is what is need as a junction is required eh? and why we need a junction so eventually we want a potential difference okay and again by physics you know the definition of potential difference is there has to be a positive charge and negative charge physically separated from each other right they have to physical separation and this physical separation when physical separation exists then only potential agrees okay you can increase the potential energy by you know changes uh, by uh, injecting electron or exciting electron from low energy level which is a valence band to high energy level which is conduction band but that is increase in the potential energy only that does not alone necessarily create a potential difference for the potential difference what is required is excited electron should not be at the same physical space but there should be a separate physical space right you are getting point so if you talk about the two different energy level so what my photon is doing is taking a electron here creating a hole and you are generating a electron in the valence band, uh, in the conduction band is so the conduction band energy level and the valence band energy level but this what is the i'm sure everybody is aware of this terminology is energy band diagram what is the y axis this axis is energy what is the x axis space or position okay so x axis is space okay so now what i'm saying is in the in the earlier diagram there has if when you want to create a potential difference there should be a positive charge at one place negative charge at other place what is happening in this case the hole is created the electron is created but they are at the same space so does it mean that you created the potential no it doesn't mean it, it doesn't you have not created the potential what you have done you only created the difference in the potential energy okay so therefore if you choose one semiconductor which is shown here you will not create the potential difference you need something else to do the potential difference so a semiconductor of p type or n type or any other type alone cannot do the job you need that physical separation and that the physical separation is possible only if there is a junction that we need to understand how right just take it right now that a physical separation is possible only if there is a junction how we'll say it. and that is how we need to generate it. is that point clear you need to teach to your students so make sure that it is clear so i'll i'll come back to that how that uh, how the separation is possible that normally is a, it takes quite some time to come to the point but take it for the right now that you need to have separate and therefore we need pn junction uh what kind of energy we have in the spectrum in the whole electromagnetic spectrum the the solar spectrum is very very narrow and the energy and the wavelength of the photons in spectrum are connected by this equation 1.125 so what we do is we will find out what is there in the solar spectrum right now very quickly so uh, one thing we talked about is the energy of the photons in the solar spectrum so just notice the solar spectrum ranges from uh, where to where solar spectrum is starts at about 2 uh, uh, 200 uh, at about 300 uh, electron volt uh i'm sorry 300 nanometer and it goes all the way up to 5 micrometer 5000 nanometer okay the the wavelength is connected with the energy of the photon with this equation which is nothing but equal to h nu nu is a frequency you divide, you convert that to c by lambda and is a lambda is in micrometer okay so let us find out what is the highest energy of the photon in solar spectrum i am saying the photon spectrum starts at near uv okay in the solar spectrum you have visible range which is 400 to 700 380 to some uh, 700 nanometer small portion of the ultraviolet is also there in the spectrum about 8% of our energy comes in ultraviolet range and then you have some infrared also okay infrared all the way till about 4 5 uh, micrometer wavelength so that is the wavelength uh and frequency is also there what i need to find out from you is what is the energy range okay what is the range of the photon energy which can be given by this so please do the calculation quickly my shortest wavelength which is ultraviolet wavelength is small when i go from the ultraviolet to visible to infrared wavelength increases okay normally this is radiation is called short wavelength and uh, this is called infrared long wavelength okay 
So, the short shorter wavelength starts at about uh, uh, let us say 380 nanometer. So, what is the energy corresponding to 380 nanometer photon? When I say 380 nanometer, I am talking about wavelength. And make sure that this is uh, this is in micrometer. Okay, so you have. Uh, I want to find out what is the energy in electron volt of a short wavelength photon of the highest energy, that is one to four, and wavelength in micrometer. How much is the wavelength? 0 0.380 because uh, it has to be in micrometer. So that is the energy at the higher side. Then I can also calculate energy in electron volt at the infrared side at infrared side our spectrum actually goes all the way up to 4 micrometer let's say okay so this is in 5 micrometer so this is 4 and what you get is in in terms of the electron volt how much you are getting here 2.96 about 3 electron volt how much you are getting here Point two eight, point two eight electron. Okay. So you have the band. So you have the photon energy going from two point nine six volt. That's about three electron volt. Okay, which is the highest energy of the photon, and the lowest energy is point two eight electron volt. Is that fine? Keep this in mind. So all our material. Now, we are now more narrow in terms of the choice of the material. So, your material has to be less than 3 electron volt and more than 0 0.2 electron volt, 0 0.28 electron volt. Okay. So, when we have energy of the incoming photon from ranging from very small 0.28 to 3 electron volt, what it can do to my material? So, one possible interaction when your energy is very, very small, one possible interaction is that uh, uh, that it does not do anything, it only uh, get absorbed in the material and only results in the vibration of the bonds between atom and atom. Okay? Various kinds of vibration can happen, that, that is the case when your photon energy is very small. Another case is that uh, when the photon is falling on, it actually excites electron. In this case, no electron is getting excited, in this case electron is excited from one energy level to other energy level. What are the circles that you see here? Orbitals, it is a Bohr atomic model. So, there is a nucleus and then you have the various orbitals. Okay. So, uh, in if the energy is between this energy level up to 3.5 electron volt, energy can be transferred from to the electron such that it goes from one orbital to orbital of lower energy to orbital of higher energy. And the other interaction could be that if the energies are very high in the in the X-rays and uh, UV greater than 3.5 electron volt, the electron may get out of the where the electron is going? It is becoming free, it is going out of the material. Okay. What is this effect called? It is called photoelectric effect. <laughs> Here the ionization is happening and this effect itself is called photoelectric effect, yeah, discovered by Einstein. Okay. What do you think which one is happening in a solar cell? Last one? We do not have energy of this much, right? We have just do the where does the calculation? What is the highest energy we got? So, we do not have 3.5 electron volt energy. So, this cannot happen. Okay? If this happens, we are still in a problem. Why? We this electron is getting out of our control. We want this electron to do the job. We want the electron to go to the load, give me the light, or run my fan, or do anything, and then get out of it. If this is going, we are still in a problem. Okay? If this is happening, there is still a problem. So, what happens? This is what is the most important interaction that we want. So, the electron or the photon interacting with the material should excite an electron such that it goes to the higher energy level in the same material. Okay, so, this kind of interaction is what is of our interest. Okay, so, this is then finally, the generation that we have the photon coming in if the photon is of energy less than the band gap energy. What happens? If photon coming in is less than the band energy, what happens? Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Okay? And the good example of this is our glass windows. Nothing happens, right? Everything comes in. The glass is transparent because 
the glass is what is one of the oxide and it is having a very high band gap. All the photons in the spectrum is having lower energy, nothing get absorbed, it everything is transparent, <coughs> everything comes through and therefore glass is transparent. Also another good example is your mobile phones. Okay? Your mobile phones, the, the radiation coming <coughs> is what radiation you use in your mobile phone? Of very longer wavelength, very small energy, and that photons having so low energy that it comes through the wall also, or the absorption is very weak. So almost behaves as a transparent. It does absorb because sometimes wall is thick, but it transparent. The so energy is so small. So it depends on the energy level. So if the energy level is lower than the the band gap difference, nothing happens. And this is one one question to your answer. Why efficiency is only 14 percent because our spectrum consists what are the wavelengths from 3 almost 3 electron volt to 0.28 electron volt and what is the band gap of your silicon 1.12 okay silicon is having band gap of 1.12 electron what does it mean many of the photons are just passing by not getting absorbed but that is not the mistake of sun sun can't do anything what you can do you are not able to use it, right? So you are passing it, you are losing it. So we are having lower efficiency. So that is one of the reason. For silicon, having a band gap of 1.12 electron volt, we lose 23 percent of energy. Not in our control. How much? 23 percent of energy just go without having any interaction with the material itself. So how much is remaining out of 100? 23 percent of electron are gone or 23 percent of energy is gone. So, remaining is 77. Let us see how come 77 becomes 14, right? We will see one by one. So, this is one thing. If the green photon comes, so sometimes we also call this photon by the color. Okay? Infrared photon is colorless, it is out of visible. right? Red photon is the photon having 700 nanometer band gap. The blue photon is photon having 400 nanometer band gap, the, the green photon is in the green part of the visible spectrum, about 550 nanometer. 550 nanometer corresponding to so how much energy? Do the calculation. 550 nanometer photon means what is the energy of the photon? So, what we need is a green photon, I am talking about, of having energy 550 nanometer, uh, sorry, wavelength 550 nanometer, I want to know how much is the energy. about 2 electron volt. <coughs> so, the green photon because its energy is higher than the band gap energy, because its energy is higher than the band gap energy, it can actually excite a foot, uh, electron from the valence band to conduction band. right? And if very high energy photon comes, the blue photon which will having energy of about, about 3 electron volt will actually excite electron to, by the what is this here? So, this is the edge of the conduction band, what is above this? What is about this? About this? What is this by the way excess? Energy. What is about this? Energy levels, but they are in continuous and we call it as a conduction band. Right? Above this is the edge of the conduction band, above this there are many energy level and they form what is called band. Below this are also energy levels, but there are it is called valence band. What is between this? There are no energy levels, energy gap or called band gap, okay? there are no energy level. Okay? Now, the blue photon comes in, it extends electron, the electron goes how much high in energy? With respect to this, how much energy it will go up? Corresponding to the energy of the photon. So, if photon energy is 3 electron, it will go up to 3 electron volt. Where is my energy level for silicon? 1.12. Okay? So, what is happening to the rest of the energy? Okay, so, this is my valence band level, conduction band level, the photon energy is coming 3 electron volt. This is my silicon, so band gap is 1.12 electron volt. If this gets excited, electron get excited go away all the way up to, so this is my zero energy level, this energy level should be 3 electron volt. So, if my electron is here, but what I need is 1.12 and because there are various energy level, this electron will actually collide here and there and actually lose its energy. It is actually going in the 
conduction band with various energy level and lose its energy. How much energy it loses? 1.88. That much energy is lost. Okay. That much energy it comes down to the same level. So, actually out of 3 electron volt how much is required or how much I can use is only 1.12 and how much I am losing is 1.88. That is another loss. That is another loss of energy. This loss of energy is significant and it accounts to 33 percent of the losses. How much? 33 percent. So, what was the last number? 77 uh, minus 33. How much is remaining? 44 is what in your hand. Okay. I tell my student that even Lord Shiva come to you and sit next to you and say, okay, what's, what can I do for you? And you say, okay, give me a best solar cell using silicon make me a best solar cell. What he will say? Sorry, 40, 50, 56 percent is not in my hand. If that has to happen, what, what you have to do? You need to change the physics. You cannot do anything with that 56 percent losses. Is that clear? So, what you have to play with is only 44 percent energy. You have to play with only 44 percent energy. You have to get best utilization of the 44 percent energy. And if engineers and scientists are getting 15 percent, is it bad? Right, out of 44 percent, if, if your current engineers and scientists are using 14 percent, is it bad? I would say not at all. You know what is the efficiency of the photosynthesis process, which is a natural process happening from billions of millions of years? What is the efficiency? It also does the same thing, right? It takes the light, converts into the mass. What is the efficiency? Less than 1 percent for most of the biomass the efficiency is less than 1 percent. Nature uses less than 1 percent of incoming light. In the best case it is like bamboo and all they use 4 to 5 percent even. So, 14 percent is not bad at all, but it is too expensive and therefore, we have to do make it further. By the way 14 percent is a model level at solar cell level people are making 16, 17 even. Uh, there are some industries like Senio and uh, Sun Power uh, which are making solar cells at more than 20 percent efficiency. Is this clear? Again very important from the solar cell perspective to understand this. Okay. Now, I have not put the any name, but if you take various materials which are the commercially available today, make it crystalline silicon, polycrystalline silicon, amorphous silicon, cadmium fluoride, CIGs, whatever it is, same kind of argument actually you can put with the other materials also. And actually you can find out exactly how much the energy you are going to lose because of the photon is just transferring, not getting absorbed, how much of energy you are going to lose because of the extra energy of the photon. Okay. We wish we can use this energy and there are some concept now uh, people are working on it is very theoretical level where we can actually use energy at that you can extract the photon at 3 electron volt level that is the best thing you can do, but very far from the practice and uh, may become reality in uh, some 20, 30 years time the, down the line not right now. Okay. Anything that goes up must come down that is a law of nature, is not it? Anything that goes up must come down and that also happens in semiconductor in solar cell. <laughs> so, electron getting excited may come down. Okay, so, it may come down directly bend to bend it is called recombination. The earlier process is called generation. Okay. This process is called recombination opposite of generation. So, the electron may come down. By the way do you want recombination to happen in a solar cell? We do not want right, because what we want? We do not want to let this electron go without doing our job. We want to do, we want this electron to do the job. What is the job? It should run our fan or tube light or anything. We do not want to do it. So, so this is, if this is a generation taking place, okay, the reverse is the recombination. We do not want recombination to take place. But eventually what happens? Electron will come down to the same level as in power plant. The electron goes up in potential, goes down, down at various substation, then comes down and comes to the. So, eventually electron will come down to the same energy level, but not without doing the job. That is the main problem, right. So, what, what we want? We do not want this process to happen. What we want this electron to actually get outside our circuit, go through the load 
n then come down, then we do not have a problem. So, this path is okay, this path is not okay, right? Is that clear? We, we, we electron eventually will come down to low energy level, but after doing its job. So, so, th so this is what we want. Without coming through the, we just it should go through and recombination should not occur, but it does occur. It does occur and th that is where the role of engineers and scientists is to actually look for the new material, which is low cost, easy to fabricate it, but is still good. So, that this part does not exist. Then there is a band to band recombination does not happen in solar cells, silicon solar cells so often it happens in a, in a gallium arsenide direct band gap semiconductor. There is a Auger recombination in which the electron which is coming down gives its energy to some other electron and goes up. The, the Auger is the name of a scientist who has discovered this. And there is another recombination where, where the defects the some energy level which are in between. Now, normally in a very nice material like single crystal material there should not be any defects or there should be very minimum defects. So, your band is actually there are no uh, continuous no defects, but if your material is defected, material can be defected due to two reasons. One reason is that the defects because of the crystalline disorder, you know in crystalline material all items are sitting very nicely in order. If some of the items are missing that is a crystalline disorder, that is a one way of disorder. Second is that if there are another impurities in your materials. If you are silicon, but there are iron, there is a copper, there is a manganese, there is a zinc and what not. So, that is another disorder. So, two types of disorder can create this kind of energy level and that gives rise to recombination. For solar cell application, this is the most common particularly silicon. For the silicon solar cell, this is the most common way of recombination. Okay. So, for 44 minus 44 minus recombination, you cannot avoid it, it is never 0, never 0. So, you, you may count for something like 10 percent losses, 10 to 15 percent in the in the good case or in the worst case it can be really huge, everything may recombine. So, 44 minus 10 you are come to 33 percent, you will still find out where are the others losses going on. Okay. So, something like this happens and the recombination you cannot avoid. Okay, fine, but uh, as I said, uh, the solar cell uh, is not just one single semiconductor cannot do that. There has to be a junction, which is so normally solar cell looks like this. You have the p-type solar cell, you, sorry, p-type semiconductor, n-type semiconductor junction between them, and then you have the contact at the both the sides, right? So, what do you want your, your solar cell to do? First of all, your solar cell should be, if light is falling, it should. If light is falling, what, what should happen? It should absorb, it should interact with the light. It should not choose a material which does not interact with the light. It should interact with the light and create an electron hole pair. Okay, fine. Once it is, it is done, what do you want your solar cell to do? It should actually separate. You know what we want eventually our solar cell? We want a electrostatic potential to be generated and electrostatic potential means a physical separation between a positive charge and a negative charge. So, after absorption, if there is electron hole pair, they should get separated physically okay? and the physical separation occurs over a p junction and n junction, p and n region. So, between over the junction, the physical separation should occur, something like this. So, electron should go at one direction, hole should go other direction, such that they are never coming back to uh, close to each other to get the recombination and that is the job of the junction. Once separated, the junction does not allow them to come together and recombine again. Okay, once separation is done, what you want? You want electron to come out of the circuit and do your job. So, then eventually you want, there are contacts at the front and back, you want those electron and hold uh, to be collected at the circuit and go through the external load. Okay, so, these are the three main function a solar cell should perform. What are those three functions? Absorption, one is absorption, second is separation and third is transportation or collection. Okay, so, these are the three things the solar cell must be doing, absorption, separation and collection. Any solar cell should be doing this, whether solar cell is of germanium or gallium arsenide or silicon or some material which is not exist today on the earth or some other combination, any solar cell 
must do this three function without which you do not get the, the job done. Is that clear? And different solar cell technology strives to maximize the efficiency of the above operation in a different way. Okay? Some solar cell have p n junction, some have the p n junction, some have the multi junction, some have the hetero junction, some have the ARC coating, some have the texturing, some have the back surface field, some have the back reflection, what not. Lot of people are trying lot of things to just do these three functions. Every solar cell should do this function. Any questions so far? No? Okay, good. Mm -hmm.